Welcome everybody. I'm Jenny Koss. Here to spend uh, 45 minutes with me talking about digitizing our photos. Uh, before I go any further, I'll tell you my email because I don't think it may be allowed at any of the documentation. And I'm more than happy to have you email me with questions if you want us me to send you something, additional information. So it's jennycoss at gmail.com and I'll write it up here on the board in a second. Um, Easy, just all one word, Jenny Cox at gmail.com. Is that in lowercase? Yes. Lowercase. Yes. No spaces, no caps. So I will also ask that this be an open interactive session. Don't hesitate to raise your hand or interrupt me or ask questions because I think that makes it more meaningful for all of us. What I don't say would probably fill an encyclopedia for those of us who still remember encyclopedias. So um, I want to be sure and not leave any subjects untouched that are of interest to you. So I put this together as a basic. Some of you may have already been partly on this journey already, and that's great. So let's just talk about where we are and, and how to get started and where we go. So uh, I structured this presentation in terms of the five W's and the A's so that we could talk about why do we want to digitize, what to digitize, when, where, who, and then how are you going to proceed. So as far as why, I think the key number one reason is for preservation. And if you have any old family photos, you know that they fade over time and deteriorate. The quality of the images blurs, fades, Particularly if you were of that generation that took the um, color photos in the 60s and early 70s, the color has totally faded out. Now, prior to that, some of the color has stayed really nice, the 50s. But when they quit using silver in the processing, color processing, that a lot of them faded. It's gotten better now, but there was that period of time when the deterioration was really marked. Also, if you were like me and used a magnetic photo album back in the day, some of those materials that we put our photos into have sped up the deterioration. So preserving those photos while we still have them is really important. Most of what I will say here would apply to documents and letters, other forms of paper um, artifacts that you may want to preserve. Uh, there may be a few departures about that, uh, how you would treat them, but for the most part, you're going to treat those the same way. Uh, the second reason I think is for sharing, and that's probably a, another really important um, reason that we digitize. It makes it easier for us to post our photos on the different genealogy websites, Facebook, and the other media. And I know if you have grandchildren like mine, it's unlikely I will ever get them to sit down and look at an old fashioned photo album, but they're all over the media. So if I put that in language that they understand and in tools that they use, I can engage those future generations. I think also if you do reunions or things like that, and the newsletters, there's all kinds of uses for your digitized photos. Um, if you're going to create a family history book, or blog or something like that, you're also going to want to have digitized images that you can embed. So uh, lots of good reasons why you would want to digitize. So what are you going to digitize? So I think one of the most important things is to kind of take, take stock of what you have. Um, my journey started in 2010 when my mom passed away and my sister and I found 12, I kid you not, 12 gigantic plastic tote boxes full of genealogical materials from both sides of my family. A lot of them were photos. And we went, oh, no, we're going to do it. So we, you do need to know the different types of photos that you have because you're going to treat them a little bit differently. So, you know, do you have 35 millimeter slides? My dad took tons of slides back in the 40s and 50s. So I have probably 500 or so of those. I treat them separately uh, and in a different way. Um, do you have glass standards or tin type? 
negatives. I have a few of those. Or regular negatives from your old 110, 126, 35 millimeter film. Um, so those you kind of need to scope. Okay, what's how much? Where's my bulk? What kind of numbers do I have in each category? And then damage. If you have some very old things that are very damaged, water stained, maybe spills of other kind, um, very fragile, some of them are kind of falling apart. I have some on glass that it, back in the day, it was a really popular <coughs> to glue your photo to the glass. And that is, they're all peeling and crackling now. So any of those kind of things, you're gonna to want to set aside and treat them special case, not in this way that I'm gonna describe for you, which is gonna be the bulk of your things. Um, you also could include documents and letters, you know, certificates and other kinds of things if you want to in this process. And then, you know, the question has, comes up by sorting. Do I want to sort all of this like by family group, by name, by decade, by, by location? And I'm going to tell you only sort or pre-sort if you don't have very many. If you're like I am and you have 12 tote boxes, there is no way. We would have spent years sorting and never got started digitizing. So we just started. And I would say that, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. If it's already sorted or it makes sense for you to sort, you can do it. But I would say you don't waste a lot of time there. So when do you digitize? Right now. I want you everybody to leave this room and plan to start. It's so simple to get started with all the tools we have right now that you don't need to delay. You may want to figure your way forward and get your feet wet, so to speak, if you haven't been doing this before, but you can start today. You may have a couple dozen items or so that you have as kind of your test case, your pilot, if you will, that you're going to experiment with, getting familiar with the equipment. What's the best way to do this? How do I? get organized for my flow of how I'm going to do it. What are my settings going to be? What tools, software am I going to use? But then practice. There's nothing wrong with that. And that's going to maybe save you time down the road than 400 photos later and you go, oh, I wish I had been standing at a different resolution. So those are things that's well worth kind of kicking the can around a little bit up front to figure out what makes sense for you. I have a question. Sure. So you had all these tote boxes, and mm -hmm. and so you just started out and started digitizing. So what if you remember that you saw Great Aunt Lucy, and you want to find that? Do you have to go through all these to find Great Aunt Lucy, or no? Oh, okay. because I'm going to tell you later about tagging and using keywords. Okay. So at any point in time, I can go through all the photos I've digitized and type in Aunt Lucy. Or if I, I'm actually using full names, so Lucille R. Anderson. And then I'm going to find everything that I have digitized about her okay. or where I have keyworded for me. So it could have even been a certificate or a letter, a school report card, or photos of her throughout her life. Okay, thank so, you. Yeah, that'll, so that's one reason I say don't spend too much time sorting up front because okay. you'll just drive yourself crazy. <laughs> So, and then a rhythm. You need to figure out, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this once a week. Am I going to do it? How often? Because if you commit to do it and you work out your process, then you want to keep doing it. If you have big gaps of time in between like six months of the last, oh, I got one and I thought, I forgot what was I doing here? You know, even if you leave yourself good notes, you'll spend time trying to get reacquainted with where you are. So it's better. When you start this journey, that you have some rhythm in mind where you're doing it on a pretty frequent basis, even if it's just a couple of hours at a time. I will warn you that I get into it and I'm buried all day and I don't want to stop. So have your calendar clear when you get started. So I have a workspace set up and I think that's important. You may not have a dedicated office or a dedicated room that you can use, but you need a space that you can work that you can have organized for, here are the photos I'm getting ready to digitize, here's my materials and supplies, 
my scanner, my computer, my finished product clean. It's got to be clean. We're handling these old documents and photos. You don't want dust. You don't want coffee spills. You don't want somebody coming in and piling something on top of your work in process, scattering your <laughs> stacks of things. And you know, the, the end, you don't want where the wind's blowing through. You have pets, you want them troubling all over things. You, know, you need a protected work space. And you might even have to put a drape over things if you don't have an area that you can protect. But you will spend a lot more time cleaning up and organizing if you don't protect your workspace. I also think it's important to, you know, run this trial run to figure out, oh, I'm going back and I'm going forth. I need to reorganize this so I have more of a, a flow to my process. And I'm always looking for what is it? Oh, my labels go. So you, you have, have your space organized. Um, make sure you have all your supplies and on hand that you're going to need. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. And then what you're gonna do with your completed scans. Uh, this class is not really focused on the storage of your um, paper artifacts, your photos and your paper documents. The one I did two years ago was more about that. You can pull that up on the website. You'll get more information about physical storage of artifacts. This is more on how you're gonna deal with the digital objects. And then good lighting and comfortable workspace. And that has to be a must or you're not gonna wanna sit there. And you need good lighting, really good lighting, so you can see some of those faded out photos and see what it is you're doing. So um, who's gonna be digitizing? Are you the only one that's gonna be doing this? Or are you gonna have other people helping you? If you do have other people help you, then you have to be careful and sit down and make sure you guys are following the same process. If you're numbering your scans, you're naming things, you're attaching keywords, your date formats, you need to be consistent. Otherwise, when you go to marry this stuff all together, you're gonna to have a big jumble. I, my sister and I started this together in 2010 and she was, uh, and lived in a different place. She used a different kind of computer, a different kind of scanner. I had mine. And so we ended up having a cloud database where we shared our finished products. But we didn't have regular phone calls because you would notice little things like in abbreviations or did we spell out the middle names or did we just use an initial? Because, you know, an initial name, a computer doesn't know and will treat that as two different people. And you want your, your data to all be together, tagged the same way. So you've got to work on those kind of things if you're going to have more than one person doing it. It's entirely possible, but you just have to be aware up front. So what equipment do I need? And this is, we're going to talk now how to proceed. So. There are flatbed scanners available anywhere from 100 up to about $500 for home use. Of course, you can get into the really high dollar ones that are used by professionals, but I'm talking about ones for home use. Um, I even found my last one was $32 on eBay, and it's a perfectly good Epson V500. So you don't have to pay a whole lot of money to get a nice flatbed scanner these days. <coughs> Yeah. My printer has a scanner. Can you use that? Well, you can. That is what I call the all in one scanners. They print, they copy, they fax, they scan. You can use those. Um, so, what I'm going to tell you is be aware of your equipment. What are the image sizes that you can scan? The adjustments that you can make. Do they allow you to scan at different resolutions? Some may, some may not. Um, and that's going to be important to you. And you want to also look at, at if you're using a flatbed, what's going to be your compatibility with your computer? If you have a, a PC or you know, are you running Chrome? Are you a Mac person? Are you a Linux? Whatever. <laughs> Make sure you have compatibility. Make sure if you're going to go buy a scanner that you know what capabilities that, that scanner has. So a little bit of reading, I've got um, attachments on the handout, well, it's in your handbook online, that give you articles you can read that'll explain to you what you're looking for. There's some comparisons that are recent that'll tell you, you know, and here's the five best scanners under $500 and here are the features of them. 
Um, the same is true of the software. Um, I did not go into all-in-one scanners, but there are lots of those. And, and if that's what you have, start with that. That's perfectly fine. Uh, they don't usually have a very big glass uh, size for your scan sizes, but I did notice up here in the tech center, they've got some larger flatbed scanners. So you can always come up here and scan some things. Um, the other option you have are camera. This can be a scanner. It has a wonderful camera on it. The challenges with using a phone camera, as opposed to, let's say, a mounted camera, is that if I'm just doing this to scan a photo, you know, it's hard for me to hold it steady, right? You have to have some software that helps keep the jiggle out. It's also going to be really prone to picking up different lights, shadows. So the people that are the most successful using a phone camera as a scanner have a holding device and a light. Now, they're not expensive to buy. I've seen them for 30 bucks, you know, at Walmart, places like that where they've got a place to put your camera, you've got a, a light that takes away the shadows. Now you still have to think about the, the background and the study and some of those things, but it's perfectly possible. There are also things that are, uh, they look more like orbs style cameras. They are much higher resolution. I think um, Topeka Genealogical Society has one, or they did have, takes a little bit longer to learn how to use them, but those are very powerful and can be used for more intricate objects. Just have a little bit of a learning curve there. So you've got options. I think if you ideally want to work in your home environment, then an all-in-one scanner or your phone, or then find you a flatbed would be the best way to start. Penny, I don't know if you're going to mention them. Have you got any experience with some of the newer sheet uh, photo scanners? Yes. What, what's your experience? I would not put my photos through those. Okay, I understand. Um, you know, if it's a, a modern day document, no problem. My, the things I'm scanning and the photos are too fragile. I would not trust anything that has to go over a roller. Understood. Yeah, and the same thing is true of, like a lot of the all in one, our machines will let you bulk scan. Mm -mm -mm. That's a good way to ruin what you're scanning because it's going to run it through the roller, and by that time, your poor photo is. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you can use public equipment. I just, I was amazed by our tech center up here. It's wonderful. I hadn't seen it since it opened. And so you've got this space computers, scanners, people to help you. Um, so this is a perfectly good way to get started if you don't have your own equipment. And that's where you were asking about media. So because these are not your computer and you don't have a hard drive up here, bring a flash drive. That you can get these things up to 32 gig, so I don't know, probably more than that, terabyte, two terabyte. So these little flash drives will hold a lot of information. And if that's what you want to do to get started, I think that's a perfect solution. Um, the only thing I would say is, you know, being a public place, you're not going to be able to sit there all day long with a whole box full of stuff and dominate the equipment. They're going to probably want you to, you know, let somebody else take a turn. So, you know, you can even talk with the people up here and find out what are the low use times, you know, come on in the morning or whenever it is that you're not going to disturb other people or you're not going to have other people waiting. A lot of um, photocopy businesses, you know, Office Max and Staples and those places, they do scanning, and I have used them a lot for oversized scanning because I have some very large photos and uh, certificates and things like that that I can't do at home. And they will do those. They charge you, of course. Um, my um, only reservation is in the people that are doing the scanning. They don't let you. It's not self-serve. They take it behind the desk and do it. Watch them. Not all of the people are trained equally, and you want to make sure that they're treating your fragile items with due care. But I've gotten a lot of things done that way. You can also do online services. I've done this for my 35 millimeter slides. It is possible to scan them on your own scanners. 
However, you're going to spend a lot of time doing it. Um, there's some specialty uh, holders that you load your slides into. You need to look at it in the light box first to make sure you've got them loaded in the proper direction. You put them on your scanner, you scan. I mean, it's it's a slow process. So I chose to have uh, an online service do the scans for me. I did pay for it. I had about 400 and some done and it was about $200. So you're the only one who knows what your budget affords and what it's worth to do, to do that. And maybe you do it in batches of 20 or 30, whatever you know you can afford. Um, so that, that would be, you know, there are, uh, they will also do some of the other more odd formats, uh, but you're really talking about specialty items when you get into the glass negatives and working with the tin types and stuff. So you want to make sure that you, you work with people who really know what they're doing. So, um, so you've got that, that's I'm talking hardware here. Now let's talk about software. So you have to have something software that scans. So there are lots of built-in scanning software in your phone. We talked about the camera. Take a picture and it goes into your photo program, whatever program you're using. Um, you don't probably don't want to leave it there, but if you're just in the process of scanning, you can put it there and then move it elsewhere for your permanent storage. Um, you've got Google Scan, Photo Mines are a real popular one nowadays. Clear scan, Microsoft Lens. I mean, there's all these different phone apps that scan. So that's one option. Then, you know, the thing I will say about these is be sure and understand how they work because sometimes you get it into their scanning and you can't get it back out easily. Or when it comes out, you lose resolution. So you want to be sure you understand how it works. And that's why I say be experimental, do some. Move it in, move it out, see if you can resize it. Can you clean it up a little bit? Oh, it was a little jiggly. Do I have auto correction in there? Can I do a little color correction? Can I rotate it in case I did it this way and it needs to go this way? So those are the kind of things, if you're going to use a phone app, play with it a little bit. And most of those, either they're free or they have a trial period for free. So you've got a chance to kick the time a little bit so you can see how it works. I think it's well worth the time to spend up front to make sure you get what you want and not get down the road and then go, uh oh. So on my computer, there's a, I'm, I'm a Mac user and there's a utility and it's a totally free utility and it's a, a scan, it's called image capture. And so what happens is I load my flatbed. Now you can see, I'm sorry, people at home, you won't be able to see me pointing, but on this image, the top one is my V500. So it, it's picking up, okay, what devices do you have loaded here? Well, I also have a, an all-in-one that has a scanner as well, and that's the second item. So I'm going to use the flatbed, direct it to that. Then you take your cursor and you define your scan range. So I could scan a subset of this. Let me get this thing out of the way. There we go. I could have scanned just a face or just inside the green border or, you know, any subset of that. I'm scanning the entire image. You define that. And then over here, you pick options. Color, how many colors? You've got options on that. You've got resolution. Talk about resolution a lot in a minute, a little more in depth. Um, size. And then it allows you to de define where it's scanning to. So if my flatbed is attached to my computer, I'm scanning into my computer, and I have a, a place there where I'm going to accumulate my scans. Um, what do I want to name my scan? Instead of the computer assigning some gibberish, I can name it. This is Jonathan and Emma Gilbert. The format, and this is important too, I'm scanning in TIFF. And then there are also some small editing corrections that you can do when you're uh, scanning. Now, this is very similar. I've used Canon, I've used HP, I've used the Epson built-in software, very similar. They all have uh, the, those attributes. They might be arranged a little differently, but they're all gonna have similar attributes. So 
my advice is to always scan the best original you have. <coughs> the copies have already been produced, and with each copy, you lose resolution. So if you have the original, scan that. The larger the original, the more pixels you're going to get. So if you have an 8 by 10 and a few 5 by 7s and some wallets, scan the 8 by 10 because you'll get more pixels that way and you want more pixels. That's a good thing. Make sure your scan is clean and dust free. Now, please do not use Indust or Windex or any of those things. There are some products. I've listed some examples here that are for photos. There's a, a product called PEC 12. You get it from archival companies. It's a photo and slide cleaner. And then there are PEC pads that come with that that are lint-free and static-free. You put a little bit of a solution on it and you can clean your photo. And that means you're not going to get those little fuzzy lines in it when you scan it because that's lint and dust that's on the face of your photo. So you also want to make sure your scanner glass is clean, totally clean. Clean it every time you use it, even if you've had the lid closed. And this is maybe one of the drawbacks about using a public scanner is that you don't know what the last guy left. Uh, were they eating chips over the scanner? Let's hope not, but you know, you don't know. And so you got, I would bring my own cleaning stuff with me if I was going to do it on a public computer and scanner and clean it before I took the time to scan anything. And again, um, Brilliant Eyes is an example of a cleaner that is um, non-toxic, anti-static, and it's used by the professionals to clean the scan glass. Um, if you're using your iPhone, we touch these things all the time and there's all kinds of handprints on here. So you wanna make sure you clean your phone and you clean the camera if you're gonna use your phone. And I put Scott cotton gloves for handling. Now this is kind of a, it's changing a little bit in the professional world. Um, cotton gloves was the standard for years. Um, and they sell them by the dozen. You can get just the plain white cotton glove. Um, now, a lot of the archives and museums are starting to go to the nitrile type gloves um, because your dexterity is better. You could get them tighter fitting. And so when you're handling objects, you get a better grip on things. Um, I think it's sure to have, it's your home archives. You do what you're comfortable with. If you can get a nice cotton glove that fits you, that size, some of them are so big they are floppy. So, you know, for me, I have small hands, but I think it's optional. But clean hands, definitely. No lotion, no nothing on your hands. Please don't eat or drink while you're doing this because you're going to introduce contamination and it's going to be on your photos, in your scans. So, uh, grouping. We already talked about that a little bit. If you have just piles of loose photos, don't take the time to do, spend, don't spend too much time grouping. Now, you may have albums where it's already grouped and you're going to scan the whole album. So leave those together by all means. It's already grouped for you. And there's something about the context of being in this album that's important to the history of that photo. So, what I would recommend is if you have photo pages, you scan the entire page as an entity with all the photos on it, and then take each photo and scan it individually as well, um, if you can remove them. Now, if you've got one of those where, you know, in bygone days, they glued them down and you're not getting it off, then your scan of that whole page is the scan. You can select certain images on that page, but you're not going to be able to take them off. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I would keep the pages all together as you're scanning, not scan these and then go scan these. And then I would just scan them one, two, three, four, five as a range if you're doing an album like that. If you are in, in one of those old magnetic photo albums that really, ah, they were so bad for our stuff, then here's your chance to take them off gently, clean them, and put them in another album that is an archival quality album. Takes longer to do, but then you're, you're solving the problem 
or at least you're going to stabilize the deterioration on those photos at that point in time. Also, be sure and scan the backs and be sure and scan the mouths because it, on a lot of the old pictures, like the one I showed you, there were there were things written in that brown border, and you don't see it right away until you scan it and you blow it up and you say, "Oh, look at this!" So you'll have people wrote the names and the date, sometimes the time. Ink's faded over time; it's hard to read. But then you'll also have the name of the photographer where it was taken, and that can be valuable to you also, particularly if you're not sure the time or place. You can find out where those photographers were and at least the era that they worked. So scan those backs as well. So let's talk a little bit about format. JPEG was the thing for many years, and I started off scanning in JPEG. It is still a very popular format, and you're going to find most of your photo databases and your online databases if you're going to share on, on Family Search or some of these other online. Everybody will take JPEG. I went to TIFF a few years ago because JPEG is a smaller photo size. Or <coughs> excuse me. It's a smaller image size. So if you want the best um, ability to retain the images you scan and the pixels, go to TIFF. Now, back in the day when I started, uh, storage space was a little bit of a premium. We, were, we didn't have the three terabyte hard drives and we didn't have phones that held all this information. But over the years, storage has gotten less and less expensive. So now it makes more sense to scan in TIFF. TIFF takes up more room on your computer because it's a more dense file type, but it stores and keeps more pixels for you. PNG is an older uh, format. It was super, it superseded GIF, which is even an older format, but you will still see a lot of things that are PNG, particularly web images, because on the web, they are not concerned with <coughs> high resolution um, originals. It's going to be what you see on the screen, and it's only going to get so good. And they are also minimizing the amount of their online storage space that they have to have for pictures. So you will see a lot of PNG um, icons, cartoons, that those kind of images. I would not recommend that for your home photo archive. <clears throat> but you can read up on that. There's a couple of really good articles in the attachments that I sent, and they get into way more detail about what and why and <laughs> what your options are. Resolutions, you've heard me mention this now several times. So I have a lot of people that will say, oh, I only scan at 200. Oh, no. Um, because in my mind, at PPI, pixels per inch, or DPI, which is an older term, thoughts per inch, so the same thing. Um, you want the most pixels per inch that makes sense for you, that is, um usable for you so i would say i scan at at least 600 and some things at 1200 now you can scan up to nine or ten thousand that is it for people that are going to be making mural size artwork that need or imax size screen you know movies um but so you, you find a happy medium because the longer, the higher the pixel rate, the longer it will take to do the scan. So the difference for me between, let's say, 200 DPI and 600 DPI on any given 5 by 7 is probably 15 seconds. So it's not a lot of extra time. And my thing is, if you're going to be doing it, do it right the first time and scan at the highest resolution that your equipment will support. Over 1,200, I don't know if there's a benefit for what we would use for home use. Uh, if you have the originals, you could always go back and rescan it at a 
at a higher rate if you decided to make a mural of dad, you know, and you need 9,000 pixels. But for the things that I've done, I've never had to go over 1,200. But don't scan it at 200, and certainly nothing less than that. <clears throat> I, you know, most people say 300 to, to 1,200. Um, it, black and white, you can actually scan at 300 and still get a crisp image. But it depends on the quality of the image and how many things are going on in the image. So if you've got a, a group photo from the second grade class and you've got all these faces in here and you scan at 300, a black and white, that's okay, but you're not gonna be able to pull out the image of, of your son and his cousin and blow them up because you don't have enough pixels. So again, why not for the extra 30 seconds you're gonna spend in the scanning process, scan at a higher resolution. So now we've talked about then what, you know, your workspace, the kind of scanning equipment or ways you would scan. We've talked a little bit about the image capture software, what kind of scanning software. Now we're going to talk about where do I store my <clears throat> digital images. So, you know, we talked about the flash drive or you can scan them to your hard drive and just have a big folder of images. But how am I going to find Aunt Lucy? <laughs> you know, so <clears throat> I always say keep your original scans. No matter what database or photo management software you use, always have your original scans so that you can go back and get them. Storage is cheap. Write them off onto a hard drive, but keep your original scans. That way you have them. But there are also uh, tons of cloud storage options now. Google Photos, Dropbox, iCloud, OneDrive, da 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 a lot of them give you so many gigs of storage for free or megs or whatever, and then you pay. It's not a lot. Um, I'm scanning to iCloud because I'm a Mac user, and so I I think I pay three dollars a month, and I've got a lot of how many gig. I haven't even begun to use it all yet. So, but shop around, do what's right for you, figure out what makes sense, what tools you like that works with your computer. Beware of file compression because some of these sites use compression. They're paying for this online storage for free, but nothing in life is free. We already figured that out, right? Read the fine print of their agreements because a lot of these places, if you store your pictures on their website in the cloud, you're giving them permission to use your photo however they want. If you're okay with that, that's fine, but read the terms and conditions. Also read about what they're going to do with your photo. Are they going to strip out pixels to minimize the amount of space that they have? So those are all really important. And typically, by paying for storage space, you're going to get less restrictive sizes and a little bit better control over your photos. Some, some sites allow you to opt out of public sharing, and you determine who gets to see your photos. Just things to pay attention to. And that's particularly important too if you're talking about documents that you're scanning as well in this process. Maybe you don't want everybody to see the letter Aunt Susie wrote when she was getting ready to divorce Edward. Whatever. You know, some stuff is just private. So think about those things. And you also want to look at, at um, tools that have some tagging some um, editing, some organizing tools, and some of them have artificial intelligence. They'll do facial recognition. That's really helpful. If you have a lot of photos where they didn't write very much on the back, maybe a first name or nothing, and yet you know it's a family member, it's a family group, you may have several other photos from that same time, and that you just know it was all the same um, family event, a picnic or something, but you don't know who those people are. The AI tools using the facial recognition can help you find those people because you may be scanning along and then the next thing you know, you come across a tool. Uh, oh, that's so-and-so, my cousin. And AI will tell you, oh yeah, they were over here in this photo too. So that's a powerful tool to use. 
Google Photos does it. I know Apple Photos does it. Some of the other ones probably do as well. And again, in the handout that you have, there's some articles and some um, discussions over the different tools and what they do. That is worth paying for because that's that metadata where you're going to find Aunt Lucy, or you're going to be able to pull up all the photos from Christmas, or you're going to pull up all the World War II photos in the Pacific, or whatever, sir, family surname, or whatever you want to sort by. You can attach your own keywords. That's the power of these tools, is being able to um, find and group those photos once you um, scan them. I will tell you, Facebook and Ancestry and some of these other sites are not for permanent storage of your photos. Please, don't think they are. They're for sharing. They're going to compress your photos and read the fine print. Most of them own your photos. So, you know, it's just... They're great for sharing, but I've had some people tell me, oh, well, I scanned the ancestry. <laughs> you know, here's an example. Okay, this is my grandpa. This is the original photo. The original photo was 5.2 meg. I scan in high resolution. And it went up to ancestry. And when I downloaded it, half the pixels were stripped out. Now, I was surprised there were that many left. But that's just an example of what happens. Don't think of Ancestry as your permanent storage space. Now, I don't know about all the different, like my heritage and families. I don't know about all those. Test it out for yourself before you put things there and make sure you're comfortable with it. Um, computer resident tools. Gosh, there's a ton. I use Apple Photos. I already mentioned that to you. There's Capture One on Victoria Moravi. They are. They can take that big pile of scans, pull them into their tool and their databases, essentially, that allow you to do that keywording and tagging and organizing, put them in the slideshows, manage your photos. And they're very, very powerful, well worth your time um, and money if you have to spend for a tool. Um, you can also do the file folder thing, and a lot of people do, and it works fine for them. Um, I have an example here. Um, yeah, to set up a file folder, it's just a hierarchical structure. So when I'm scanning in, if I know this is all the Smith family, and then underneath there, I've got a file for each person, and you just put their photos in there. Um, that doesn't you know, give you the same power as a database, but it's going to be better than just having one big file, right? You can organize them whatever, however you want to do it, because you know, it's your, it's your photos. Um, you can also have a, a unknowns folder that you're going to come back to, hopefully, and identify later. Add metadata to your images. This is so important. And this is at an operating system level. So this, my example is not on the Mac, but I know Windows does this as well. Um, you, it's a right click on the image and it brings up a box where you can fill in Keywords, um, name, attributes, comments, you know, and it will tell you when it was scanned on what equipment and all of the information. So use that on every single photo as the starting point. Um, I number all my images as I scan. Now, I, my numbers are not smart. I didn't try to make the 1000s be this and the 2000s be this. I just started one, two, three, four, five to infinity because if I'm using metadata and tagging and keywords, I don't have to remember. Oh, I ran out of numbers in the one thousands. What am I going to do now? And I have all just it's a number and it's a reference number that you can use. Okay, thank you. That you can use to tie your digital image to the physical photo. So I have an example here in these. I know our folks at home aren't going to be able to see this. Maybe they will be. Of where what I do, it's pretty simple. I have little tags that I put the number on on each photo. So there's a photo. There's its scan number. Now it's on the digital image. It's also small on the back of the photo. So if I take the photo out of the sleeve for some reason, 
I can marry them all back together later. And I may do that for some purpose. And this is why you scan backs also. This is all the people in my sister's second grade class. My mom diligently wrote the names on there. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a clue who kids were. So, you know, I use numbers. You can come up with a, a numbering scheme if you want. Sometimes if I scan front and back, it'll be 10 A, 10 B. You make it work for you. No, no magic there, just whatever works for you. Um, I talk about what how to store your scanned images more in my presentation two years ago, but I do use the sleeves. I have the small size sleeves. I have up, the, up to five by seven. Um, get them from an archival storage company. Don't use Ziploc baggies. There are some types of plastic that are very bad for your photos. For eight, five by seven and eight by 10, I use sleeve protectors. Again, make sure you're using the right kind of plastic. I think you can pull up my old presentation still. Sherry alluded to that earlier. And in there, I'm going to use a plastic that are you know, acceptable to use. But that's from Office Depot. So that the sleeve protectors were not anything special. Do what works for you. <coughs> so here's my plan. And I want to show you, because it's sort of getting close to the end here. <laughs> Sorry, this wind is really making me cough. You know, there I was up in the upper left hand corner in <laughs> chaos. Started scanning. I, I put them on my computer. I create a scan log, and I'll show you an example of that in just a second. I put my photos either in these sleeves for the four by six and under, and then I file them in an archival photo box like that. Or the bigger ones I put into the sleeve protectors, and they go into notebooks. And then the notebooks have a little label on the front that says scans, da 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 da, 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 da. So the scan log is was a tool that I used between my sister and I because we were doing this long distance. Um, but I also found it helpful, even with my computer management program having the keywords and the metadata and all of that, I still found this very helpful. It's just an Excel spreadsheet, scan number. Um, the type, you know, I kept it simple. Is it a photo? Is it an album? Is it a letter? Um, what's the title of it? The main thing going on. The date taken, if I know the place, um, the description. You can add as many columns out there as you want. If I want to do follow up research, you <coughs> can know, just go double check this, you know. So I found that to be very helpful. I think the summary is. Keep it simple and get started. That's the key. <laughs> All you need is a way to start scanning, a device to store and organize your scans, and then a method to label your scans for future use. So um, your photos that you started that were you scanned in the street bags, did you go back and scan one for the next? Not. Do you plan on it? Maybe. I have about 8,000. It would be a considerable job. Right. So. I don't know. I have so many more to go yet. I'm only half done. So I don't know. I may leave that to the next generation. <laughs> Do you uh, retain the 35 millimeter slides? Yes, I sure do. I keep all of the originals. Um, I'm trying to keep them all nice and organized. And eventually when I pass and my sister passes, we are going to will some of those to different historical societies and archives. Um, the originals. The kids don't want that stuff, but they're happy with the digital stuff. So, so you have a follow up to the question she was asking. Uh -huh. Have you done any experimenting with scanning as JPEGs uh, and converting with the video editing software to TIFF versus originally scanning it as a TIFF to see what your quality differences are like? I have not, but JPEG's not going to capture as much. Agreed. So you would have a TIFF format, but you're not going to probably improve what you scan. So if I hadn't done the experiment, you would assume it wouldn't be as good. Right. That would be my, my assumption. Did you have a question, sir? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. This is going to be on uh, the library's 
uh, this little right. Okay, because I want to. The handbook is out there now, but has the handout, and I believe <coughs> the presentations are all going to be up there as well. And thank you. Email me anytime. Is the Excel spreadsheet example in your handout? No, it is not. So if you want to email me, I'll send it to you. That's a scan log. Yeah. Just the scan log on your channel. Yeah. I'm just, sure. You have columns at least to start. You can change. And then add as you go on. Absolutely. I'm happy to share because I'm happy to have other people on the journey. And uh, so I appreciate you all coming.